uh, commemorating the Lord's table today. We are going to enjoy that celebration. And so the, uh, the verbiage and the way that we look around that old rugged cross is going to be exemplified and experienced uh, by us in a moment or two. Uh, the topic today is a threat to the ministry, and in some ways, my apologies if you happen to be a newcomer today. Um, this is not the prettiest uh, picture uh, of the uh, early church. As a matter of fact, it exemplifies something very, very different in, uh, in the way things can go sideways. And so uh, we are going to read together Acts chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 1. And uh, you will catch on as we read what's going on here. Verse 1 says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And a great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? She said, yes, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And the Lord add his blessing as he speaks to us today through his word. Father, we ask that you would help us understand what's going on here uh, to a point that we get to reflect on our own motives and actions. And Lord, we know that nothing is in the word by accident, that this historic event and events took place uh, for our purpose as well as theirs. And so I pray that your spirit might guide us today in truth, as he always does, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's uh, go through this. And uh, I know you're excited to try to find out what happened here. Uh, so we will dive in. Uh, some of you are asking, why are we spending time looking at this? Well, uh, the first thing is, you know, we are as a church asked to, uh, to break out the whole counsel of God. There's nothing that really is to be hidden from us. And so uh, together, whether it's, it's happy or sad, whatever it happens to be, uh, we want to see what God might have for us uh, in it. And so that's probably the number one reason. There's no good reason to ignore this. Uh, and secondly, it impacted the church. It really was an amazing event. There's this thing called the Barnabas effect, Barnabas effect. So we're in chapter 5. Chapter 4 ended with this person, Barnabas, uh, who was also called Joseph, but they called him Barnabas uh, uh, because of his great nature and generosity and, and all of that kind of thing. And so Barnabas sold a piece of property and then donated it to the church, and, and that was that. And so this then follows... That after that event, and so let's understand that that event took place when the church was going wild. I mean, a good, in a good way. Like, it was, it was a good wild. Like, people, people were coming to know Christ and, and, and being healed and all kinds of amazing things were happening around the church. And they were strengthened, encouraged, and they were emboldened to talk about Jesus more. And this was in the culture that, that didn't really believe that, that that was even possible. Matter of fact, they took it as a threat to their own being, especially the religious leaders. And so, and so the church grew stronger and became more threatening. And so there was this Barnabas if, effect. There was this powerful profile in Barnabas. Sold his property. 
Um, I think we want to recognize that the way the word reads is he sold probably a piece of property. Barnabas would have been a wealthy guy. It didn't mean that he sold all that he had, but he certainly sold one of his pieces of property. Now, that's an interesting note. And it's interesting because of the way that Ananias and Sapphira responded later. It's a powerful profile. It's a powerful new community. And, and, and this began to unleash a new, a new and very real threat. Uh, and we're going to be introduced to this threat. So the more powerful the church got, there was another threat that was coming. So let's look at number one, the threat led by Satan. So we won't, we won't mince it because the Bible talks about it. We'll talk about it. Um, Satan is real. Uh, he has lots of people working for him. And by people, I mean uh, demons and, and fallen angelic beings that are working uh, on his behalf. Uh, he influences so much. And, and so the, the things that are attributed to Ananias and Sapphira find their source in satanic. That gives you a clue as to why this is serious. The Bible talks about Jesus' dialogue with Peter. Peter did not want Jesus to go to the cross. He didn't want, want him to die. And Jesus looked at him at one point and said, uh, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, because you don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. There is a differentiation in all of Scripture, and certainly in Christ's eyes, that if you don't have the things of God in mind, there is danger. And there's a threat if Satan can ever, or his, his enemies, or the philosophy of the world can move us to a point where we're thinking of us first and not God first. That's a problem. And the church needed to know that they didn't have the things of God in mind. At least these two didn't. They had the things of men. There's the lust of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life. I'd like us to read together this John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and following. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, listen to this, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This threat is serious. This threat back then was not that, oops, somebody kept a little more money than they ought to have. No, no. The dialogue was with Satan. And the conspiracy with Satan was Ananias and his wife believed that they could actually, they could actually have it and have it all. And so we'll talk about where that goes, but, but let's understand this. For us to really be fully engaged in the walk of God, we've got to work on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Our three big dangers. And when I say we've got to work on it, there's not a 10-step program for this. It's a be filled with the Spirit program. If you want to battle this, if you want to make sure you're sincere before Jesus Christ, you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you. And then you keep in step with the Spirit. You don't do anything that could potentially grieve him, and you need his strength in order to do that. So this is a yielding issue, and it's important, because number two, the threat points to pride. This threat from start to finish, sorry, got excited and bashed my ear. This threat points to inwardly what was going on. Pride is a source of so much. And as you and I know, if we're being real, it's probably one of the key reasons why we're not walking fully with God now, because I've got a lot of me in my life, and I got less of Jesus in my life. And Rob Hayes, that's a problem. We need to address that on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Number two, the threat points to pride. The threat to the church points to the pride of this individual. They conspired with the enemy. 
It wasn't just that, that we sort of fell into this, and they were good people, gracious people, and they, they, they just sort of stumbled. No, no, no. They conspired. They thought it through with the enemy. Satan addressed them, gave them opportunity. They loved it, and they conspired together. Satan and Ananias, his wife, conspired together. Let's see how we could make this work. They pretended so they'd be favored. We could have it all. We could still be rich. We could still have and pretend that we gave and be honored amongst people. That was the issue. We could have it all. Lose, lose proposition. They thought it was a win-win. Isn't that funny how the enemy works? He'll propose this to us, and this will seem like a win-win. Oh, good. People will adore us. Quite likely, this was a public setting. And the same way that Barnabas brought, brought the, the earnings from the sale of his land, he brought it and put it at the apostles' feet, usually in a public setting. He did that humbly, and he did it just because he was a, a, a follower of Christ. But people noticed. I'm sure Ananias and Sapphira took a look at that and said, man, we can do this and people will notice. We can be in favor of God and these people, and still get rich. Hmm. They conspired. They thought it through. It wasn't that they were just nice people. No, they were not nice people. They were people that became enemies of God, and they were using the circumstance in order to gain. Who knows what they were going to do with their newfound honor in the community, but Satan knew and likely he had plans for them that was not going to do the church any good. Any threat that pride me first brings, pride is bad because it allows me to be God. I'm God over my stuff. I'm king of the castle. Sometimes I sit in front of my TV. I put my feet up. I have my cup of coffee. And I go, wow, Rob, you've got it made. Look what you have done. Those are the moments where I'm glad I'm married, because Dot will go, why are you sitting down? <laughs> There's stuff to do. One of the chief reasons for man to be married is not so he will not be alone, although that's helpful. It's to keep you humble. To have somebody that lives with you constantly rub the rough edges off of you. It's why kids are good for kids. It's why kids go to school. It's why kids have to learn to play in the sandbox. That's what marriage is like. Amen. Learn to play in the sandbox. Learn what's yours isn't yours. Learn what mine is yours. This is a shared thing. I know I wanted that now. You have it. That's what it's about. And by the way, that's what kids need to learn all the time. Adults, we need to learn that all the time. This is a, a shared community. We have what we have in order to give it away. That is a win-win proposition. And pride often threatens to kill that. We shouldn't forget that it's a lose-lose proposition. Let me read this to you out of Matthew 12, just in case we need to be clearer. Jesus saying, you brood of vipers. <laughs> 12, verse 34. Did I not give you the... From Jesus' mouth, he's looking at, at those who are wanting to pontificate about what's right and wrong. You should read the chapter. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Listen to that. The heart speaks, or the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Now go to this chapter in Acts chapter 5. What words were Ananias and Sapphira speaking? They were speaking words of condemnation. They were lying. 
They were seeking to say good things, but they did it out of a bad motive. So they were saying bad things. And those bad things already condemned them. And in Jesus' mind, that they were condemned already. And so what ended up happening is that condemnation from God immediately came upon them. Because they deserved it. Lest you think those poor people. No, no. They were enemies of God. Let's look at three. Let's understand this, that anything that quenches the spirit is a threat to the body. Any, anything that, that, that is, a, is, 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 is against the Holy Spirit is a threat to all of us. The fallacy of only one, oh, it's just one of them. How could that matter? We're, we're going to stop right there. Do you honestly think that what happens to you doesn't matter to the body? If we're all joined, and we are, it's like what happens to one part of your family impacts the rest of the family. If, as we've discovered, if one of the kids are sick, we're all sick. We all pay a price for that. Filters all the way down. And so there's a fallacy of only one. Oh, it was just Ananias and Sapphira. Why was that condemnation so hard? Because it was a threat to the body of Christ. Jesus wants you to know that the threat to the body is a threat to his body. And it's not just like stubbing the toe and oh, we'll get over it. This was, as we say in business, mission critical. This was a mission critical problem. In other words, it threatened everything. Partly because it's a reputation of character, it's a reputation of, of what God will or will not put up with. And so somehow Jesus thought this was worthwhile nipping in the bud right now. This timing was perfect. Interesting, huh? What do we take home from this? So enough of the historic event. Let's talk about this. Because what happened when I was going through this story, as I told the, uh, the Bible study this, this past Friday, I read the story over and over and over again, and it never stopped really making me wonder about my own motives. Is that happening to you right now? Lord, what about me? Like, what, what are my motives in, in all, all of this? So three things came to mind. You can add more yourself, because I'm sure there's way more, but it caused me to reflect on my goals. When, I, when I'm doing something, whatever it is, is it for the Lord, or am I looking at personally gaining? Is, is, it, actually, is it actually a clean and, and speed bump free gift? Am I helping somebody because I, I, I think I'm going to like what they can bring to me after? Or am I, just, am I just doing it for God? Reflect on your goals. It's a good thing to do. Raise your guard. It's okay to be on guard because, because who roams around like a prowling lion? Satan. Seeking who he may devour. And as soon as I think I am not susceptible to his schemes, I am in trouble. I am susceptible to his schemes. I, I, can, I can fall to lust of eyes. I can, I can fall to the desires of the flesh. I, I, I can enjoy the, the pride of life and what it's brought to me. I mean, those, those things I can tend to dwell on if I don't raise my guard. And the guard, look at Ephesians and walk through the full armor of God so that you can stand. And I like this last one, reason with God. Make sure your reasoning is with him, not with the enemy. If you're ever going to dialogue, dialogue with God. Go to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, how are my motives? Search me. Allow me to see if there's a, 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 an impediment in me that's going to harm. Am I, am, I, am I in love with you? I would suggest that periodically you read through 1 Corinthians 13. Love is. Because the Bible said without that, Everything else we do is just a noisy, clanging cymbal. A loud trumpet. It gets in the ears of everybody, but it's not profiting anybody. 
if I don't have love, patience, kindness. I mean, it breaks it down for you. And 1 Corinthians 13, just circle the spots where you think you might need a little help. And if you're not sure, ask those who love you. Would you circle the areas in which you think I could use a little help? Ask them to circle it in red. And say, don't be kind, be honest. Reason with God. Lord, Verse 11 says, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Got everybody thinking this way. If we're feeling that, that oh man, Lord, what are my motives? Let, you know, I'm really wondering now, and, and what, what is God? God is saying, this is for real. This relationship that we have is not to be, to be fooled around with. This, this is for real. The body of Christ, this, this is for real, and great fear seized the whole church. And the last scripture I'll give to you before we take our communion today. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided to give in your heart. Decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. No outside force should, should interfere with what you and the Lord have decided, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will bound in every good work. We read this and we say, fear not. But this is the way we can guard ourselves. Dialogue with one another. Determine before God what it is you want to give, whatever that happens to be. Remember, the more generous you are, the more abundant God answers. That's, that's the flavor of the day. And God is able to bless you abundantly. Do you believe that? As you give, God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times. You will never experience a moment where you don't get his blessing. You will have all that you need. You will abound in every good work. Everything you put your hand to, you're going to see fruit. And may the Lord bless us as we pay attention to his word this morning. Father, thank you. Thank, for, thank you for the boldness of those in the early church that can talk to us today about what's really important. Lord, we will be on guard. I say this, Lord, and uh, you invite us, and we invite the Holy Spirit. Come in and, and, and do what he needs to do in our lives to make sure that our motives are great. May we focus on you, and, and we know that as we focus on you, you will take care of us in every detail, and so we trust that that's true today. And Lord, if there needs to be forgiveness asked, then we, we ask it. If we wonder about our motives sometimes, let's let us stop today. And may that holy fear grab us, because we don't want to mess with you. Lord, we thank you that you have provided all comfort to us, and the assurance that we have salvation, for if we have trusted you, we know we are covered. And we cling to that today, and we thank you for it, and as we celebrate uh, the great news of your death, burial, and resurrection. We pray that you continue to guide us in this truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.